Matthew, it's the last verses of the gospel. When we meet Jesus, he's with the 11 disciples. They have met him where the women told him, or excuse me, told them to go to a mountain in Galilee. Jesus has been resurrected. He has greeted the women, Mary and Mary Magdalene. They have gone back and told the disciples to meet him there. And now he's going to give them the last piece of their ministry. This is called the Great Commission oftentimes, and it's found in Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Listen to a word from our Lord through the writer of Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. Go now and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. So every hero's journey includes a couple of different parts. One of those parts is to leave his or her home and go learn something, something incredibly important. Many times it's multiple somethings that the individual is to learn. They're to learn from a specific person, a guru, a master, a rabbi, a Jedi, if we're going to go popular culture. When they learn these things, they are then to take them out into the world and to use them, to benefit from them, to remember them when experiences come up. They're to go now out into the world and baptize the nations, as Jesus tells the disciples. Once they go out into the world, they have everything they're supposed to know, do they not? The whole of Matthew's gospel has been preparing the disciples for this moment. The whole of the Hebrew Bible has been preparing them for this moment. To know what to do. To know how to do it. Jesus is essentially saying to his disciples, you have got this. I've taught you everything you need to know. Now just go. Go to the nations. Baptize them. Teach them. And know that I'm with you always. Go. Nothing derails a hero's journey. Nothing derails anybody's journey than four words. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? When I say those words, do you do like I do and instinctively want to grab the imaginary steering wheel that's in front of you so tightly that you see white knuckles and you want to yell to your children, grandchildren, spouse, whomever, you'll be there when you'll be there. Are we there yet? The worst four words in ministry, I would say. When I used to lead mission trips, I had one rule. Trust me. Trust me was what I would tell all of the leaders and all of the youth and all of the people that were under my care. If you will just trust me, things will go fairly well. If you will just trust me, I will get you where we're supposed to go. And I took that seriously. And so every night I would prepare for the next day. I would sort of go off on my own and I would read through maps. This was before smartphones were smart enough. And I would gauge how long it was going to take each group to get every spot. If we were in Chicago, I would figure out the train schedule and the bus schedule. If we were driving, I would figure out how long it would take. And I would promise to get you there. In that trust me rule, I said, don't ever ask, are we there yet? You'll know when we're there. Fridays are always the worst on mission trips. You're tired. People are starting to smell a little funny. 
It's been a long week. You're, you're, you're now starting to think everything is almost over. I'm ready to get home. I was in Atlanta. I was with a group of middle schoolers. God's gift to ministers to remind them, are they really called to ministry? We were driving through Atlanta because Atlanta is a southern city and we love our cars. And so I had prepared Thursday night and said, guys, we're going to be driving through the heart of Atlanta during traffic. It's going to be bad. But I need you to follow me and I need you to follow my second unwritten rule. And that is if I make it through a light, you should too. We'll pay the ticket. So we made it through the lights. We got to the largest intersection in Atlanta. I made it through the light. The car behind me made it through the light. And the third one was Christian and stopped. So we had to pull over. I hate having to pull over. But I pulled over and I looked at the kids in my care and said, do not ask if we are there yet because we're not. Trust me. And I waited and I was looking in my rear view mirror waiting for the person to come, waiting and waiting. The kids were suddenly rocking in the back of the church bus, and I didn't think much of it. They were entertaining themselves, and then suddenly they were all on the right side of the bus. And my co-pilot, who was a senior in high school, kept pulling my arm and saying, Ben, Ben, and I looked at him and I said, I'm going to make you walk if you keep talking to me. (laughs) And finally, he said, you need to look outside. We had pulled into Atlanta's largest liquor store. Not only that, but Westminster Presbyterian Church was on the side and we had pulled under a sign that said, come on in, we'll take care of everything you need. (laughs) Trust me, I always told them, I will get you where you're supposed to go. Jesus has taught me everything that I need to know from the Gospels like the disciples. But the truth of the matter is, we want this to be our hero's journey from here on out. But what Jesus does is incredible in this particular text. In fact, what Matthew does to highlight what Jesus does is absolutely incredible. The first lines set the stage of this entire text. The 11 disciples came to the mountain. Some of them worshiped and some doubted. What has been a perfect group of 12 men who have followed Jesus since the beginning of his ministry. The 12 who were supposed to take over the 12 tribes of Israel. This perfect group who would take the message into the world is now imperfect at 11. Judas is no longer a part of the group. And not only that, some of them are doubting whether this is Jesus or whether they're supposed to be there or whether Jesus is going to really do what he says he does. And in this moment... We join the 11 imperfect souls. We join the 11 imperfect disciples. And we realize that Jesus' hero's journey is not over. Even though we sort of want to nudge him out of the way and say, we've got this. We are good to go. I planned the night before I can drive us through Atlanta traffic. We are good to go, Jesus. Right about now, I was paying attention to the fact that it's about to be graduation season. And this is when I start to pray in particular for the seminarians who are about to graduate. Because every seminarian who wants to serve in the church is shot out of seminary like a cannon ready to change the church. And sometimes they come in like a cannon ready to change the church. We have learned everything we need to know. We have learned all the practical, all the emotional, all the spiritual, all the theological things that we need to know. You just need to follow us, right? And then someone in the church asks those four horrendous words that turn into a question. Are we there yet? And so I say a prayer because the reality is we think we are shot out of cannons at the mountain of Galilee to go take Jesus' message into the world and Jesus is reminding us that we're actually one of the 11 imperfect disciples. Now this can easily slip into something I don't want it to. And that is, if this is Jesus' hero's journey, we don't really have a role to play, do we? If Jesus is going to take care of everything, 
then we really don't have much to do. But that's why Jesus continues and says, you do have a role. You're to be my messengers. You're to go from this space, this mountain, into all the nations of the world, whether you can get there or not, whether you can pray for them, up close or from far away. Oftentimes we think if it's not our hero journey, we don't need to care about it. But Jesus is saying, no, I've taught you everything so that you can do ministry with me. What I find fascinating about this end to Matthew's gospel is it starts the same way. Long ago, we started reading Matthew's gospel, and it starts with the genealogy. Do you remember that genealogy? It is the most imperfect group of people you've ever met. There are kings who are not great kings. There are three Gentile women who somehow got into the lineage that created Christ. There are people that did things that their mothers would not be proud of, and God certainly did not think that that was good, and yet they helped create Jesus. And Matthew's gospel ends in the same way. Eleven imperfect men gathered on a mountain, some of them doubting, but all of whom receive a call, a perfect call to go. To go now. Now we can just accept this and go from here and say this is a great day, but I think this call is more important than most. And so I was trying to think about how I could put this call into your own lives and not just have it be Sunday, April 28th, and you take it and you hear a good message and then you go off on your own. And in the process of this week, I've started reading a book called Joyful about how small little changes have dramatic effects in our lives. That we are in a culture of big change. If you don't like your house, move and get a bigger one or get a smaller one. If you don't like your life, move and change everything about it. Get rid of your clothes, get rid of your cars, get rid of your spouses, change everything. And the reality is it doesn't change a thing other than what's on out the outside. But what's inside, the joy, is still missing. But small, subtle changes have dramatic effects. A little bit of color. Using circle shapes. Because they invite playfulness and joyfulness as opposed to squares. And so I thought that it would be pretty dramatic if you all walked into this sanctuary and saw neon orange walls. But then I really didn't want to find a new job, so I chose not to do that. And then I thought about, we'll just change everything to little circle things, but then I thought, where do we start and where do we stop? And then I realized all week long that I have this propensity, whenever I walk through a door frame, I tap the top of the door frame. I'm not sure if I was supposed to play football at Notre Dame at some point and didn't make it athletically, but I always touch them. And then I realized something this week that I've never been able to touch that door frame because I can't jump that high. But then I thought I always look up and maybe what we could do is put up there, go now. And then outside the next door, we could say, make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then, since all of our Christian education happens this way, I thought above this door we could put and teach them everything that I have taught you. And I thought we could just put all of that up. But I didn't have the time this week to do all of that. And then I remembered one thing about this text, and that is the last line. Something I would like for you to memorize this week. You can write it down if you want. I am with you always. As a part of the 11 imperfect disciples, some of who worshipped and some of whom doubted, Jesus gave them a call. I am with you always. For some of us who are going to hear this call and run out into the world and share it and preach it and proclaim it, I am with you always. And some of us who forget everything that I have said and everything that has taken place in this space, I am with you always. 
When we want to nudge Jesus out of the way and let this be our hero's journey, Jesus consistently comes up again and again and says, I am with you always. To the end of the age. So this week, I want you to hear the joy that comes in the phrase, I am with you always. Thanks be to God. Amen.